Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2007 Bob and Kim Griffin Building U.S.-China Bridges Lecture Series. My name is Yang Wei Zhang, and I am the new director of the China Center at the University of Minnesota. I am extremely pleased to be here this afternoon, and to host this great event on our campus, featuring our outstanding speaker, Ambassador Jeffrey Bader, senior fellow and director at the John L. Thornton China Center in the Brookings Institution. I am very delighted to see that this year's lecture is once again attended by many of our colleagues, students, and guests. We are joined here today by our distinguished friends Bob and Kim Griffin, whose generous gift has made this event possible. With their strong desire to build a legacy for their children and for Minnesota, Bob and Kim Griffin donated $500,000 to the China Center to create an endowment fund for the annual Bob and Kim Griffin Building U.S.-China Bridges Lecture Series. The Griffin's gift reflects their solid commitment to promoting understanding and a mutual respect between the two cultures, and their great passion to connect people with China. Bob Griffin is president of the Griffin International Companies, which he founded in 1997. Under Bob's leadership, Griffin International Companies has become one of the leading import firms. And fastest-growing companies in the Twin Cities area. It is with the greatest pleasure that I extend a special thank you, on behalf of the University of Minnesota and the China Center, to Bob and Kim Griffin. We are forever grateful for your family's generous donation, and we thank you for providing the opportunity for all of us to gather here together. And hear the views and discussion of very important issues that influence U.S.-China relations. In the past, with the support of Bob and Kim Griffin's endowment, the China Center has sponsored several such lectures given by the prestigious China experts from around the world on the campus of the University of Minnesota. These lectures have proven to be tremendous. Educational opportunities for the U of M audience, and have had a profound influence on our understanding of the most pertinent and timely issues related to U.S.-China relations. Today, we are once again honored to have another extremely knowledgeable expert to speak on a very pertinent issue. We are eagerly looking forward to Ambassador Bader's lecture. Before I extend an invitation for Bob to come up to the podium and speak to us, I would also like to take the opportunity to recognize Dr. Hong Yang, former director of the China Center, for his outstanding service to the university and the community, and his instrumental role in making the Bob and Kim Griffin Lecture Series a huge success. Dr. Hong Yang, please stand up and to be recognized. Now, please join me and welcome Mr. Bob Griffin. Thank you very much, and thank you, Dr. Zhang, for that nice introduction. I'm a little humbled by the the words that you said, and thank you very much.、Uh, thank you all for attending the、uh, 2007 Kim and Bob Griffin Building U.S.-China Bridges Lecture.、Uh, I'm very excited to hear from Dr. Bader. We've been back in the green room, and I've been hearing some of his experiences over his life and his、uh, working work with China. And I'm very excited to hear what he has to say today. And especially, I have, I'm excited to hear what he has to say today, based on the timeliness of his topic. Uh, and the things that are happening in the world today, I've been very, very busy over the last year working with my company in and out of China.、Uh, my company has obviously grown, as Dr. Had the doctor had said,、uh, considerably over the last five years, specializing in consumer products to retail derived from China.
in as much as that i'd like to say that my seventeen years of focus on china and my hundred plus trips and my probably now cumulative two plus years of spending time in china makes me comfortable about speaking to the china story i have but only my experience to draw upon when it comes to describing the chinese people and its culture to that end it kind of saddens me about this mattel issue regarding lead paint and for that matter other other products or brands that have had safety violations in my acquired view of being a brand or an importer myself the brand the importer the retail buyer the government both us and china and the factories have a distinct responsibility for product safety and as an importer from china myself i take the the issue of china bashing a little bit more personal than most the evolution of china is directly related to our ability as a country to build bridges to become a protectionist is not the answer nor on the flip side uh... should we be allowed to stand by and watch these things happen and have factories ship unsafe products to the world humbly i submit that in, it is in the spirit of building understanding and communication with China that will address these issues. Greed, as I have read, by the factory should be expanded to maybe the greed for the pipeline. Understanding and communication is at the heart of the reason for this lecture series and why I so passionate believe, passionately believe in the China Center's mission. And with these recent stories, why we all need to be vigilant in our study of China and its people. I am sure that today uh, our speaker, Dr. Bader, will put an exclamation point on the U.S.-China understanding and why it is so important to our common goals. And I again thank Dr. Bader when he comes on for his time and his expertise today. Lastly, I need to thank my wife for being a great partner, mother, and supporter of me and China. It's with her support that this lecture series is happening. And of course, I wouldn't be before you today without her. So thank you very much. The Board of Regents um, of the University of Minnesota approved at their last meeting the appointment of the Associate Vice President and Dean of International Education, and that's our new leader in University uh, International Education, Ms. Meredith McQuitt. I would like to ask her to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to echo uh, Dr. Zhang's comments about the significance of the Griffin Lectures and how much they've added to our campus. Uh, since 2001, uh, through the donation and the thoughtfulness of the Griffins and the hard work of the China Center, uh, we've provided a series of timely, thoughtful, and provocative lectures. And I think today is going to be no different Driving to work this morning, I heard what many of you may have heard on NPR, and that is the price of oil has reached $82 a barrel, which is the highest it's ever been. And I thought to myself, I'm particularly interested now in hearing from Dr. Bader. Jeffrey Bader is director of the John L. Thornton China Center and senior fellow of foreign policy studies at the Brookings Institution. The Brookings Institution traces its beginnings to 1916, when a group of leading reformers founded the Institute for Government Research, the first private organization devoted to analyzing public policy issues at the national level. In 1922 and 1924, one of the Institute's backers, Robert Brookings, established two supporting sister organizations, the Institute of Economics and a graduate school which bore his name. In 1927, the three groups merged to form the Brookings Institution, honoring the businessmen from St. Louis whose leadership shaped the earlier organizations. Dr. Bader, as I say, is head of the China Center for the Brookings Institute, but he also serves as a member of the Academic Advisory Board for the U.S.-China Congressional Working Group, He's a member of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and a member of the editorial board of the China Security Magazine and a member of the Policy Advisory Board for the Asia Society. He is well suited to deliver his lecture to us today. Prior to his work with the Brookings Institution, Dr. Bader has served a number of relevant positions to his current position. Since 1975, he's been involved with the U.S. State Department. He's been, among many other things, ambassador to Namibia, 
Director for Asian Affairs of the National Security Council, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs, Assistant U.S. Trade Representative, Deputy Council General to Hong Kong. He was Director of the Office of Chinese and Mongolian Affairs for the U.S. State Department. Dr. Bader has graduated from Yale College in 1967 and earned his MA and PhD degrees in European history from Columbia University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bader in his lecture to us today on China and the Middle East, from revolution to stability to challenge. Good afternoon. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Young Wei. It's good to be here in Minneapolis after Washington. Uh, I've been asked by the University of Minnesota's China Center uh, to speak today about China's relationship with the Middle East. Uh, this is not a topic that uh, 10 years ago anyone would have invited me to speak about. Uh, even now in Washington, I get more queries about China's relationship with Africa than I do about China's relationship with the Middle East. But I think the organizers of this event, uh, frankly, have it right. The China-Middle East nexus is one of the key uh, relationships in the emerging world order, as is inevitable with two parts of the world that have been growing uh, rapidly in wealth, uh, influence and importance in the last few years. I'd like to begin with a little history. I think that's the appropriate way to start when you're talking about the policies of a country with a 4,000-year-old civilization and one whose citizens are prone to thinking in historical terms. Uh, in the 1960s, China's foreign policy, particularly in the Middle East, represented little more than an extension, the overseas extension of Mao Zedong's revolutionary policies at home. China had few relationships with countries in the Middle East. Its most important one was with the Egypt of Gamal Abdel Nasser, the leader not only of Egypt, but the um, dominant voice of the Arab secular socialist uh, socialist movement that was the prevalent ideology of the day in the region. Indeed, when China called home all of its ambassadors during the Cultural Revolution for re-education and indoctrination, the only ambassador deemed important enough to stay in place was its ambassador to Egypt. China also was one of the first countries to recognize the Palestine Liber Liberation Organization of Yasser Arafat receiving visits by Fatah officials as early as 1964 and a visit by Yasser Arafat himself in 1970. China was a strong supporter not only of the PLO, but of uh, more radical groups like the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. The relationship with the PLO was consistent with Mao's global policy of supporting so-called wars of national liberation. And indeed, the PLO looked to China as a guide and mentor. The PRC then was a strong critic of Israel and entertained no relations with it. Uh, during this period, China's relations with the Middle East were based overwhelmingly on ideological affinities and the associated global political strategy, not on economic interest. China was self-sufficient in petroleum, and its rudimentary economy did not need oil imports or natural gas imports to keep it going. The Daqing oil field in Heilongjiang was, uh, began production in 1959, eventually reaching a peak uh, level of about a million barrels per day, which supplied most of China's oil needs. China's approach to the Middle East started to change in the 1970s as it aligned itself with the United States against the Soviet Union. China established diplomatic relations uh, with the government of the resolutely anti-Soviet Shah of Iran in 1971. 
It retains relations with Iran after Khomeini's takeover, though with little enthusiasm for a regime animated by religious zeal alien to China. Uh, in the 1980s, China's interest in the Middle East was driven primarily by opportunities for arms sales. During the Iran-Iraq war, with most of the major Western arms suppliers, arms manufacturers on the sidelines observing an embargo, China became a major arms supplier to the tune of several hundred million dollars per year to both sides of the Iran-Iraq conflict. Chinese state-owned companies also realized there was a potential niche for the sale of ballistic missile technology in the Middle East that Western suppliers were constrained from, uh, from selling by the rules of the Missile Technology Control Regime, the so-called MTCR. Accordingly, in 1988, China sold medium-range CSS-2 missiles to Saudi Arabia, uh, after which charm Chinese arms dealers began marketing M9 and M11 missiles to Iran, Libya, Syria, and other Middle Eastern regimes, as well as Pakistan. These latter sales were never consummated, in large measure thanks to vigorous U.S. diplomacy uh, that persuaded the Chinese to hold such discussions. All this changed in the 1990s. Overwhelmingly, the most important reason for the change was the transformation of China's energy needs. Observers usually date the, China, uh, the Chinese economic mi miracle to 1978 when Deng Xiaoping suddenly reversed uh, a quarter century of Maoist economics and instituted market-oriented reforms and opened China's door to foreign trade and investment. In fact, the dramatic takeoff in China's economy really began in 1992, 1993 with a well-publicized trip by Deng to southern China, during which he demanded that government and economic leaders throw off the remaining shackles of the state-dominated era. Since then, China's uh, gross domestic product growth has averaged about 10 percent per year. China has become, along with the United States, the chief target in the world for foreign direct investment with uh, over $60 billion a year flowing into China each of the last three years. Uh, by comparison, India attracts about $4 billion per year. Factories funded by uh, investors from Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Europe, uh, the U.S., and Japan have sprung up in the areas around Shanghai, Guangzhou, Tianjin, and Dalian. Simultaneously, somewhere between 10 and 13 million Chinese are moving per year from the countryside to the cities, probably the largest migration in human history. China has developed a vast middle class, which, like middle classes everywhere, want to drive their own automobiles. There are right now about 25 to 30 million vehicles on the road in China. Uh, Mid-range estimates are by 2020 that number will leap to 120 million. Uh, add up all these factors and you have a China whose need for energy has exploded. China first became a net importer of oil in 1993. In the 1990s, world demand for oil rose by about 25 percent. Chinese demand for oil rose by 100 percent. Since 2001, China has been responsible for about 28 percent of the world's growth in demand for oil. This coming from a country that today is responsible for only about 8 percent of the world's consumption of oil. Experts' projection of China's future oil demand ranged from 10 million to 13 and a half million barrels per day by 2020, up from about 7 million today. This would make China's demand about somewhere between one-third and one-half of American demand. 
And to meet that level, imports will need to rise from today's level of about 3.5 million barrels a day to somewhere between 6 and 11 million barrels a day by 2020. The, region, the reason there are such large gaps in these estimates is uh, depends on what projections you use for China's growth. But in the last 15 years, uh, China's growth and its energy demand have exceeded the highest, uh, the highest expectations in all cases. China has tried to cope with this explosive demand for oil in several ways. It has licensed international oil companies to explore its coastal waters, but the results by and large have been disappointing. China showed significant improvements in energy efficiency from 1980 till 2000, as is typical with countries at its level of development. But since then, its energy efficiency has plummeted, largely because it has um, been producing vast quantities of steel and aluminum, which are extraordinarily uh, energy-intensive industries. China requires about eight times as much energy for a unit of increase in gross domestic product as does Japan, about three times as much as the U.S. In 2005, China's premier, Wen Jiabao, announced a program designed to reduce energy demand by the growth in energy demand by 20 percent in five years. But in its first year, China did not come close to achieving its target. China has realized that it has no choice for the foreseeable future but to import large quantities of oil to drive its growth. And the principal source of that oil is the Middle East. By 2015, it is estimated that China will import 70 percent of its oil from abroad. And 70 percent of that 70 percent will come from the Middle East. In the mid-1990s, when China's dependence on imported oil began to grow, China's three national oil companies, the China National Petroleum Corporation, Sinopec, and China National Offshore Oil Corporation began to invest overseas. They did so for the reason any profit-seeking company would do so, because oil fields at home were drying up, new fields were proving hard to find at home, and international prices were higher than domestic prices because of price controls at home. In 1995, China National Petroleum Company made its first investment in its most productive and subsequently most controversial overseas field, the Greater Nile Petroleum Operating Company in Sudan. Other investments have followed in Kazakhstan, Iran, Venezuela, Russia, Canada, Indonesia, Angola, Nigeria, and Peru. So I'll talk for a few minutes about three countries of particular interest for China for reasons of energy in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Sudan. Now China has made a substantial bet on its relationship with Saudi Arabia. Sinopec, Saudi Aramco, and ExxonMobil reached agreement in 2005 for a $3.5 million upgrade of a refinery in Fujian province in southeast China, aimed at expanding capacity from 80,000 barrels a day to 240,000 barrels a day. Sinopec also has an agreement with Aramco to build a 200,000 barrel per day refinery in Qingdao. Both of these deals will rely substantially on processing Saudi crude, so they offer demand and supply security to the two sides. Uh, indeed, the Saudi-China relationship has progressed so rapidly that the two sides have begun talking about building a strategic petroleum reserve uh, in China. In addition to being China's leading supplier of crude oil in most years, Saudi Arabia has become the leading supplier of petrochemicals for China's textile manufacturers. This all has happened in the 17 years since Saudi Arabia and China uh, belatedly established diplomatic relations in 1990. China's relationship with Iran 
has long presented the U.S. with challenges. In the mid-1980s, when the U.S. was reflagging and escorting Kuwaiti oil tankers to prevent Iranian attacks in the Persian Gulf during the Iran-Iraq War, the U.S. leaned heavily on China to halt its sale of silkworm missiles to Iran, threatening high-tech ex- threatening to halt liberalization of high-tech exports to China if it did not do so. China did, suspending its sales of silkworms in 1987. Then in 1997, on the eve of President uh, Jiang Zemin's visit to the United States, the first contact at that level since 1989, the Clinton administration pressed China to halt its cooperation with Iran's nuclear program and its sale of C-801 cruise missiles to Iran. China again complied, terminating all nuclear cooperation with Iran except for work on one uh, test reactor then under construction. More recently, Iran's nuclear program has placed Tehran squarely in the U.S. bullseye once again, and China finds itself under scrutiny as well. Iran was China's third largest supplier of oil last year, supplying about 11 percent of China's total imports. More importantly, China has signed a memorandum of agreement with Iran that, according to press reports, would provide up to seven, somewhere between 70 and 100 billion dollars in oil, gas, and infrastructure development in Iran. The largest piece of that project would involve an investment by Sinopec in the Yadavaran oil field, expected to pump about 300,000 barrels a day when the field reaches its operating capacity. In addition, the memorandum calls for Sinopec to import 10 million tons of Iran, Iranian liquefied natural gas per year for 25 years. Uh, these grand plans so far have come to naught as disputes over pricing and other aspects of the deal have kept the memorandum a dead letter. Chinese companies are also building the Tehran subway system and China is Iran's largest or near largest trading partner. For many years, the U.S. has been seeking to isolate Iran, opposing a unilateral investment ban on that country and actively discouraging investments in the oil and gas sector uh, by other countries, by companies from other countries. The The Europeans and Japanese have informally gone along with such sanctions. More recently, as concerns over Iran's nuclear ambitions have grown, the U.S. and its European allies have put forward a series of resolutions in the U.N. Security Council imposing limited sanctions on Iran. China, along with Russia, has resisted passage of these resolutions, only agreeing in the final instance after time had passed, pressure mounted, and the bite of the sanctions diminished. Uh, it is entirely likely the U.S. will continue ratcheting up pressure against Iran through the Security Council with sanctions that come closer to affecting investments and Iranian imports. Additionally, the U.S. Congress is considering legislation that would sanction foreign companies investing in Iran's oil and gas sector and possibly eliminate the president's waiver authority designed to forestall impositions of such sanctions. This will prevent China, this will present China with yet another dilemma, such as it faced in 1987 and again in 1997, whether to go along with U.S. concerns about Iran or stick with the Iranians. My own view is that if China is forced to choose between this relationship with the U.S. and its relationship with Iran, it will certainly choose its relationship with the U.S., but it prefers not to make such a choice and won't do so so long as it can hide behind Moscow. Such a decision will be a tougher one for China than the 87 and 97 decisions with its dependence on Iranian oil and gas that did not affect its calculus in the earlier times. In fact, China does have substantial countervailing motives 
to oppose Iran's nuclear weapons program. With its growing dependence on the Persian Gulf for oil, it has a strong interest in ensuring stability in that region. A nuclear-armed Iran, Beijing understands, would be a major destabilizing force. Beyond the impact on the immediate region, China fears that the breakdown of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty would not be limited to Iran, but could spread to other regional states like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Turkey. Inevitably, after that, other states, especially Japan, might consider going nuclear. That would be a security nightmare for China, and it will give it considerable reason to maintain solidarity with the U.S. on the Iran issue. The strategic significance of Sudan does not compare with Saudi Arabia's or, Iran, or Iran's, but China's relationship with it has gotten more attention in the U.S. than its ties with those other countries. This is because of the investment by China National Petroleum Corporation, China's largest state-owned petroleum company uh, in Sudan. CNPC has a 40% stake in the Greater Nile Petroleum Operating Company, along with the national oil companies of Malaysia and India. It is the largest energy overseas investment of a Chinese energy company with the capability of producing 460,000 barrels per day. Sudan's oil is particularly well suited for China's refineries. So typically much of its production is shipped back, shipped back to China for processing. When reports of genocide in Darfur first began reaching international audiences, China resisted proposals in the UN Security Council to impose sanctions on Khartoum. It did not want to jeopardize the privileged position of the China National Petroleum Company, though it cast its opposition to sanctions on the basis of its support for the principle of non-interference in the internal affairs of sovereign states. The U.S. and Europe have pressed China not to disinvest in Sudan, but to use its substantial influence with Khartoum to persuade it to allow a larger African Union force under UN command and control to deploy into Darfur. The Save Darfur advocacy groups have taken to labeling the 2008 Olympics planned for Beijing the, quote, Genocide Olympics in order to shame Beijing into taking action. They have also put the notion of a boycott of the Olympics into popular discourse. Faced with rising international embarrassment, the Chinese have shifted their, posi their position perceptibly in the last few months. They supported UN Security Council Resolution 1769, calling for a deployment of a force of about 26,000 African Union troops in Darfur. They sent an engineering battalion to Darfur to build barracks for the troops. They seem to be using their behind-the-scenes influence with Khartoum to encourage it to cooperate with the UN. I'd like to say a few words about China's relations with Israel. Uh, after decades of hostility, China established relations, diplomatic relations with Israel in 1992. China had come a long way since its uncompromising support of wars of, natural, of national liberation in the 1960s and had begun building informal ties with Israel in the 1980s. There were three principal factors propelling China's interest in establishing ties with Israel. First, a desire to acquire technologies from Israel's advanced military industries. Israeli companies cooperated, have cooperated with Chinese counterparts on a number of projects over the last two decades, including the, the design for engines on China's J-10 fighter aircraft, which bear a striking resemblance to Israel's Levy fighters, Falcon airborne early warning systems, assault weapons, pilot training, communications and surveillance gear, and Harpy assault drones. 
Israeli arms sales to China have aroused the ire of American defense officials, concerned both over improvements in Chinese capabilities and indications that U.S. technologies were being transferred to, uh, to the Chinese by Israel without authorization. The second factor was China's hope that Israelis, through their excellent connections with American officials and relations with the American Jewish community, could help protect China against hostile swings in American policy and opinion. And the third factor was China's realization that if it was to be taken seriously as a player in the Middle East and play the uh, global security role to which it aspires, it could not have relations with only one side of the Arab-Israeli conflict. China's rising dependence on Middle East oil and its growing interests in the region have raised questions about possible security implications for the United States. This is, of course, a part of the world where our, our own security interests are substantial. China's military spending has been growing at the rate of about 12% for over a decade. This year, it's projected to grow at a rate of over 17%. Pentagon reports have characterized China as a country with the greatest potential to become a, quote, peer competitor of the United States in years to come. China is upgrading its ballistic missile fleet, is developing cruise missile, surface-to-air missile, and anti-satellite capabilities, has substantially expanded its diesel submarine fleet, and has deployed 800 to 900 intermediate-range ballistic missiles opposite Taiwan. Uh, there is no question that China has become a more formidable military power in the Western Pacific, particularly in terms of its ability to threaten Taiwan. It is much less apparent, however, that this regional strength translates into an ability to project power globally or in the Persian Gulf. China has no aircraft carriers. It does not have overseas bases. It lacks a long-range bomber fleet or the ability to maintain uh, logistical supply chains over thousands of miles. President Hu Jintao has spoken publicly about the vulnerability of oil shipments through the Straits of Malacca. And the PLA Navy has used the supposed vulnerability of sea lanes of communication as a justification for building up the Chinese fleet. There is an active scholarly debate in China about the risks of dependence on Persian Gulf oil, on the dangers of dependence on the U.S. Navy to patrol the sea lanes, and on the desirability of increasing energy ties with Russia and Central Asia to avoid such dependence. Nonetheless, China has not yet moved beyond deployment of a regional navy to a true blue water global navy. As Chinese leaders contemplate their security options for the foreseeable future, they have determined that they not only cannot challenge the United States, but indeed need a good relationship with the United States in order to achieve their development needs. That has meant that calls for development of a blue water navy and the other accoutrements of global great power status have been kept on a relatively slow track. While China has become a more substantial player in the Middle East, one should keep that influence, particularly in the security field, in perspective. Chinese arms sales from 2001 to 2004 did not place it among the top five uh, suppliers of weapons to the developing world. Between 1997 and 2004, China ranged between one and a quarter percent and 2.8 percent of total global arms sales. Its sales to the Middle East during that period accounted for 34 percent of its total sales, the lowest percentage of any major arms supplier country. Its biggest clients from 2001 to 2004 in the region were Egypt, with 300 million in sales followed by Iran and Kuwait with 200 million apiece. 
Its major exports were a few dozen armored personnel carriers, a handful of minor surface combatants, anti-ship missiles, artillery, and surface-to-air missiles. Uh, this is a far cry from the kinds of transactions that the U.S., with over 50 percent of global arms sales and the recently announced proposed $20 billion sale to the Gulf states, conducts in the region. China's rise has made it a factor in the calculations of Middle Eastern states. They are looking to Asia, principally to China, as a hedge against problems or downturns in their markets in the West. And they are developing trade and investment ties reflecting that. Every time the Saudis hear American politicians talking about achieving energy independence, China looks more and more important to the Saudis. The Saudis are not, however, looking to China as a guarantor of their security in the manner that the U.S. plays that role for Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf states. China simply is not in a position to play that role and will not be for the foreseeable future. Iran is a partial exception in that its ties to China could have larger security implications for the United States because of the, inability, because of the ability of China as a permanent member of the UN Security Council to shield Iran from US-driven sanctions. In Iraq, while China opposed the US-led invasion, it did not take nearly as active a role as Russia, France, or Germany in seeking to, pre to prevent US action. And it has not sought to fish in troubled waters since the US effort there bogged down. China will play a more active role in the Middle East and its politics in the coming years as a consequence of its growing economic power. But it would be wrong to think of China and the U.S. as on a collision course in the region, I believe. The argument that China is somehow locking up supplies of Middle Eastern oil, which seemed to be the theme, for example, of the hit movie Syriana, should remain in Hollywood. China's growing dependence on Middle Eastern oil will continue to, ex to exert upward pressure on global oil prices, perhaps to a degree comparable to the unrelenting appetite of American oil consumers. But it would be wrong to think of the international oil market as a zero-sum zero game where Chinese deals in Saudi Arabia deprive the U.S. of much-needed oil. The international oil market efficiently distributes oil to consumers, and Chinese purchases in one country mean that oil is available from other countries for purchases by others. Indeed, if one looks at the issue purely from the perspective of assuring adequate supplies of oil in international markets, we should welcome Chinese exploitation of new fields, including in places where we are unwilling to invest. It simply expands the global pool. So while the U.S. and China may increasingly bump into each other in the Middle East, it would be a mistake to presuppose that this means a likely war over energy. Uh, in closing, I just want to say that I believe that over time, we should look to engage and involve China in our own diplomatic efforts at stabilization in the Middle East, much as we have included the Russians in the Middle East peace process to resolve the Israel-Palestinian issue. In the long run, it will be better to have China inside the process playing a constructive role rather than outside as a potential spoiler. Thank you very much. I look forward to your comments, criticisms, questions. And I can't see too well. Is, is there a microphone? If you just come up to the microphone front and ask your questions. Uh, yes, I have one uh, question for you, which comes out of your talk. Uh, my experience in China is that uh, the uh, energy is a very strategic resource for them to continue on the path of the growth 
which they have now and projecting. Uh, you did allude in your talk to Central Asia and uh, Russia. Uh, to what extent do you think China has ability to diversify its sources supply because the relationship between Moscow and Beijing is much better than it was before? Um, I didn't talk about that too much because the focus of our discussion today is China and the Middle East, but you make an excellent point. Uh, right now, I think China's getting perhaps perhaps 7% of its imported oil from Russia. Uh, there aren't, uh, most of it's coming by truck and by train. There is a lot of discussion about building new pipelines from Russia to China and also new pipelines from Central Asia. Uh, indeed, a pipeline that from Kazakhstan was recently opened to Western China that at full capacity will move about 200,000 barrels a day uh, into China. The Chinese are talking to Turkmenistan uh, about a pipeline for natural gas to be constructed by 2009. Uh, the China-Russia oil relationship has been troubled. First, a few years ago, the Chinese tried to make a large investment in Yukos. Uh, the next thing we know, Mr. Kolokovsky found himself in jail, uh, and Yukos uh, effectively ceased to function. Um, I recall a Chinese delegation from the China National Petroleum Corporation that went to Moscow around 2002, 2003 to work on a deal. They landed at the airport and they got kidnapped by the Chinese mafia and disappeared for a week. Um, that did not enhance confidence uh, between the two sides. Um, the, uh, Putin has been uh, using pipelines as a lever in his relations with Europe and with Asia. Europe has gotten most of the attention, but Asia, the same thing is going on to a lesser degree because there aren't that many pipelines in place yet. But there is discussion of building a major pipeline from Western Siberia, uh, and it will go either to the, uh, the coastal city, Russian coastal city of Nakhodka near Vladivostok, or to Daqing in Northeast China. Um, the Putin and the Russians have been basically uh, promising to whoever makes the best bid the last time which way it's going to go. And they've gone back and forth between Daqing and the Kodka, um, depending upon who was offering how much financing, much to the disgust of the Chinese. Uh, the latest word is that they'll try to build spurs to both. Uh, it's not clear whether the market will support that, but anyway, there have been a lot of problems in getting that relationship off the ground. Uh, I, I agree with the premise of your question that if you look at it purely from a strategic point of view, it makes a lot of sense for the Chinese to uh, increase their ties with Central Asian and Russian state, states. And, and certainly you're absolutely right about the Chinese seeking to diversify supplies of oil and gas. And if you look uh, at where they're getting their oil and gas from, you know, 10 years ago it was mostly coming from a handful of countries, Indonesia principally among them, uh, and now they are global. Chinese national oil companies are present in about 50 countries uh, around the world. Um, the, the leading supplier to China last year was Angola. They're, uh, they're in Angola, they're in Equatorial Guinea, they're in Nigeria, they're in Ethiopia, they're all over Africa. Um, there is a considerable debate within China about whether these investments mean anything, uh, whether they do anything to promote energy security for China. Because in point of fact, let's say Chinese have an equity oil field in Sudan or hypothetically in Venezuela, and let's say that the U.S. and China were to get into an armed conflict over Taiwan. Well, the U.S. would blockade China. Uh, and it wouldn't matter who owned the oil, it wouldn't get through anyway. Um, but, uh, I mean, I've seen a fair amount of literature among Chinese scholars debating the issue of whether dependence on the seas uh, and the U.S. control of the seas is a riskier strategy than depend depending on 
Russian supplies. Uh, and it's an unresolved debate. Um, I, I think that the Chinese are going to continue to look to diversify. Uh, if the Russians get some outside investments in their oil and gas sector and really start building up capacity, the Chinese will probably look to them more. But the Russians have not been doing that. They've been adopting a very nationalistic approach to exploitation of their energy sector, and it's been limiting the growth in supplies. In your discussion of uh, China's role in, in Sudan and uh, criticism from the international community about their failure to, to do more to influence the government there, mm -hmm. you mentioned that their response is, that, is their longstanding um, reluctance to interfere in the internal affairs of other nations. And it sounded a little bit as if you consider that just to be a fig leaf or, or a hypocritical stance. But I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about that. I mean, it is, mm -hmm. at the very yeah. least, a very long-standing yeah. position and one which they use to, to forestall criticism of their own human rights policies. No, that's a good point. And let me uh, – uh, you did pick up the, uh, the nuance in what I was saying, but let me, let me expand on it a little bit if I could. Um, the Chinese do have a long-standing position of principle and I take it as a sincere position of principle uh, against interference in the internal affairs of other countries. And that is a principle that flows out of their own experience in the so-called century of humiliation uh, beginning in the, with the Opium War uh, and Western intervention in an occupation of China. So it is a real position uh, and it's a deeply held position. Um, I think what you detected in my uh, a skepticism about its application in Sudan was um, not so much a questioning of the position as a questioning of its applicability to this particular case. Uh, after all, what we're dealing with in Sudan is, uh, by the account of the Secretary General of the UN and, of the UN and others, is a genocide. And China is a signatory, uh, has acceded to the Genocide Convention. Um, the Genocide Convention brings with it obligations to China and to other signatory states. Um, the UN has uh, adopted a principle, the so-called right to protect, uh, which means that vulnerable populations uh, can look to the United Nations, uh, particularly in the case of genocide, for protection if the host government cannot provide protection. Um, the U.S., uh, and Europe are not looking for China to, uh, how should I put it, overtly interfere in Sudan's internal affairs. I think what we're looking for is for China to use normal diplomatic pressure of the sort that every country in the world uses uh, in its relations to the extent that it can to affect the behavior of another government. Uh, and in this case, to use its excellent relationship with the president and government of Sudan to persuade it to cooperate more fully with the UN Security Council in deployment of a larger force. Uh, we're not suggesting that the Chinese should um, interfere in the internal affairs of a country through other than normal diplomatic pressure or through participation in UN Security Council consensus. Uh, I, I didn't mean to question the general uh, commitment of the Chinese to the principle of non-interference. It's, it's an important principle for China, particularly in its relations with Africa. Uh, and it's something that China uses to considerable advantage in its relations with Africa. Um, the African countries, of course, all come out of a colonial experience uh, with all of the um, natural resentments uh, against outside interference and foreign powers throwing their weight around uh, uh, on the continent. And uh, uh, even after the colonial experience, we now have a new form of Western uh, approach to Africa, which is uh, an assistance on conditionality uh, in lending. Uh, when, uh, when the IMF and the World Bank uh, the IMF and World Bank have programs in most African countries. They have strings attached uh, for how much a country can borrow, uh, for how it can use its foreign exchange earnings. 
the U.S. in its development of assistance with African countries has standards of good governance, um, standards of transparency, anti-corruption provisions, uh, all, uh, a whole array of standards that it applies, which makes sense to us. Uh, and we have come to these principles from bitter experience in assistance to African countries. The Chinese proudly tell the Africans they're not going to do that. They are going to provide investments and aid without strings attached. Now, there's a big debate emerging in the international aid community about whether this is good or bad for Africa. Uh, but I, I don't think that, that um, uh, our pontifications are going to change the Chinese approach in the short term. Uh, I think we need to uh, engage the Chinese and to give them a sense of uh, involvement and commitment to Western coordination on investment and aid uh, principles and give them a, a seat at the table in shaping those principles if we expect them to live by the same principles that we're living by. Otherwise, they won't. Um, you referenced diplomatic pressure. I was wondering, um, you mostly said in regards to U.S. pressure on China. I was wondering if you had any um, insight into the, the possibility of devaluation of the U.S. dollar and the effect of uh, Chinese ownership of U.S. foreign debt and how that might allow China to put pressure on the U.S. in the global realm. Uh, that's a big question. Um, let me start with the renminbi. Uh, there's a general consensus among economists, most economists, that the renminbi is undervalued. It's not universally held, but that's generally believed. I believe that. Uh, since the Chinese, uh, since 2005, the Chinese have allowed the renminbi to move upward by about 10% against the U.S. dollar. At the same time, the U.S. dollar has been falling at a precipitous rate against the euro and also against the yen. So while they've devalued against us in, in trade balance, in, in trade weighted terms, the renminbi has not been devalued in the last couple of years. China is running a, last year ran a $232 billion trade surplus with the United States. It's the largest trade surplus of any country in history. Uh, its global trade surplus last year was about $187 billion. Both of those numbers are going to be up sharply this year. Now, most economists will tell you that, that bilateral trade deficits don't matter, that what matters is global balances. And that's a long discussion, but you know, let's stipulate that for the sake of discussion. China's bilateral surplus with us is not primarily based on the undervalu undervaluation of the renminbi. It's based on several other factors. The most important one is that China has become the center of a regional integrated manufacturing sector in East Asia in the last 10 years. Capital, factories, resources have flown, have, have flown into China from Taiwan, from Korea, from Japan, from Southeast Asia at a staggering rate. Uh, if you look at the trade flows between China and the countries of the region, uh, I used to have these numbers at my fingertips, but just to take my word for it, they range uh, upwards from, in the last five years, upwards from 150 percent to 400 percent in two-way trade among China and the countries of the region. Um, the countries of the region overwhelmingly are running surpluses with China. They are sending, so for example, let's take computers, okay? Um, five years ago, most of our imported computers came from Taiwan. I don't know, five, six billion dollars a year in imported laptops from Taiwan. Now, almost none of our computers come from Taiwan. What's happened is that Taiwan has moved its assembly plants 
for computers over to the Shanghai area on the mainland. And so if you look at the trade figures now, it's less, I think it's less than a billion dollars a year in computers coming from Taiwan. Last year, the single largest import of the United States from China was computers and accessories, $45 billion. It was an inconsequential number five years ago. That doesn't mean that China has built up a $45 billion tra uh, computer business in the last five years. What it means is Taiwan has moved its computer business to China. Uh, so uh, if you look at overall U.S. deficits with the East Asian region, the U.S. deficit vis-a-vis -vis Asia in 2007 is smaller than it was in 1990. Okay. Um, what we have is an inflow of all of this investment and all of these uh, products into China, which formerly came from the region. And the region is benefiting enormously from it because they already say they're running surpluses with China. So that's the first factor to keep in mind when you see this deficit number, is it's really a regional number more than it's a China number. The second most important factor in the surplus uh, in the principal cause is the ratio between savings and consumption. The U.S. savings rate is somewhere around 0%, give or take 1%. The Chinese savings rate is about 40%. Okay. When you save a lot, you don't spend, and you don't import. When you spend a lot, you do. So we're importing, and they're not. The reason Chinese save so much, I mean, it's partly, partly cultural propensity, but more than that, it's structural. Um, China has a one family per child standard, okay? So you're, let's say, uh, uh, let's say you're a 30-year-old, you're married, you have one child. You know when you get old, you, hopefully your one child survives and can take care of you, but it's only one child, okay? They have essentially uh, the least socialized health care system in the world. Chinese pay more per capita for health uh, without assistance from insurance of any country in the world. Basically, they used to have a health care system provided by state-owned enterprises that broke down as China's gone capitalist. Now they have very, f uh, in the cities, less than half the people have health care and minimal at that. In the countryside, the number's trivial. Uh, they do not have a functioning national social security system. They have one on the books, but it's supposed to be funded locally, and most of the localities don't fund it. So you're a Chinese 30-year-old with one child. Um, you've got to plan your own future, uh, your own old age. Your kids aren't going to take care of you. The state's not going to take care of you. You have a medical episode. You're stuck. So what do you do? You're safe. Uh, so that, uh, and, and we are their mirror image. So those are the principal factors. Uh, in the in the trade imbalance, the value of the renminbi is a factor. Uh, it probably wouldn't make much difference if the Chinese revalued, unless other Asian countries revalued as well. And then I've seen estimates that might, if there were a significant revaluation of the major currencies in Asia, it might make a 50 to 60 billion dollar difference uh, in the deficit. Um, the Chinese have been using these massive surpluses they've been accumulating to, uh, to invest. And what they invest in, they invest in U.S. Treasury certificates. That's the best, uh, that's the safest, they're pretty conservative. That's the safest investment out there. The official estimates are that they have a bit, little over $400 billion in U.S. Treasury instruments. Uh, I can't remember. I, I think Japan may still hold more. I don't recall the China will, if they haven't passed Japan yet, they will. Um, they've got over a trillion dollars in foreign exchange reserves. I suspect the actual number in Treasury instruments is, in fact, much higher than the unofficial number. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we had the, uh, the Sinuk Unical debacle a few years ago, which you all will remember where 
China National Offshore Oil Corporation tried to buy Unical for $19 billion. Um, and Chevron, in a hostile bid against Chevron, and Chevron uh, mobilized his friends in the Congress and uh, blocked, effectively blocked Sinuk's bid. Um, Chinese companies and, are, and the Chinese government are looking to earn more than 4% that U.S. instruments will provide. So they're looking to invest in equity overseas. It's natural. The Chinese have created a $200 billion sovereign wealth fund, uh, and um, they'll be looking to make other major equity investments like the failed attempt to acquire Sinuk. Now, how much – you're getting – finally working my way back to your question. Sorry for the long circumlocution, but I, I thought the background was important. How much leverage do they have? How much leverage does it give them? I think not much. Um, every day there are about $500 billion in U.S. Treasury instruments traded globally, I think, something like that. So let's say that the Chinese woke up one morning and decided to dump their $400 billion. Um, that's less than one day's trading, um, which, of course, they would not do. If the Chinese were to dump their treasury instruments, of course, they would be significantly devaluing an asset that they own. Uh, I'm not sure I can think of modern instances where countries have effectively used uh, leverage of that kind. You know, the, I, I think the Chinese are as dependent on the value of the dollar uh, as we are. Um, that said, I, I, you know, I would never defend for a moment our approach to financing our debt. Uh, I think it's disgraceful that we are running these kinds of, uh, of debts, uh, that we are dependent on foreigners to buy so much of our debt. Uh, it creates a long-term situation. I don't know if they will have uh, – I guess I could picture situations where they might have leverage over us. But more importantly, it just creates the circumstance for an ever more a declining dollar uh, until the dollar's value, dollar's declined, I don't know, 80 percent against the, you know, when I left the U.S. government, the euro was worth 80 cents, it's now worth $1.40. Um, and this is a result of our, uh, of, of our, uh, of our trade deficit. Uh, so it is in the long term certainly an untenable situation, but I, I don't know if I'm deeply concerned about the leverage of, of one country. I am concerned about the vulnerability of our financial system and the dollar as a consequence of it more. Questions? My question relates to refinery capacity. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And it's triggered by uh, a comment that you made about world markets as well as the Chinese ability to process Sudan crude. And this is premised on my understanding that an increasing percentage of the world reserves, including those in the Middle East, are high acid and require different refinery capacities. And my question is, since China is out investing and investing in new refineries and things of this nature, in addition to supply of crude, do we also face some issues uh, with regard to refinery capacity that China is, in, I understand, investing in uh, that um, allows them to tap into new uh, sources of uh, oil uh, coming on the market that we do not have the ability to? Or is the refinery capacity um, between what we have in the United States and access to not really an issue in how we get our – get and use uh, the world's supply of oil? Well, I, I mean, the way the international energy market works is that, you know, oil companies, um, when they make investments, they're – you know, they are thinking – long and hard about who's got the refining capacity, uh, where that oil is going to go, uh, and is there the refining capacity for that grade of oil. And that is 
precisely what's been going on in the Saudi Saudi China relationship. Um, and that's why I think that Saudi Aramco has been investing so much uh, in China. Uh, I think they want to assure that they have an alternate set of refineries that can handle Saudi crude uh, in the event of instability in Western markets. Uh, I see the Saudis very much as looking at China as a commercial hedge and looking at refinery construction uh, as part of that. I think this issue also has arisen with regard to the oil sands in, uh, uh, in Alberta. Um, the Chinese have invested some there. The U.S. has invested some. Uh, those, uh, the, the reserves there are, are massive. I forget the numbers. I mean, I think that capacity, what production might be as much as, I've seen numbers on one and a half, two million barrels a day at, at some stage um, uh, if the technology continues to be developed. But that, those fields, I mean, that's an extremely heavy oil even after, uh, even after processing. And I think, I think you would need to have uh, somewhat customized refineries to deal with uh, uh, Alberta oil sand uh, production. I think the refinery issue is one reason why Venezuela has not emerged as a significant partner for China. Uh, Venezuelan crude uh, is uh, heavy and not of a, a sort that is suited for Chinese refineries. And uh, that, uh, although Chavez has been desperately chasing after the Chinese, basically to try to tweak uh, the U.S., the Chinese have been relatively unresponsive because they don't see any particular benefits uh, in acquiring Venezuelan crude. Uh, the only way that that would change would be if Venezuela were to undertake significant investments in refineries in China. And I, I, given the way Chavez is throwing his other money around, I'm not sure he has the capacity to do that. So I, I think that the refinery issue uh, uh, is a, a critical issue as specific oil companies look at specific deals and look at, look at their markets. I'm not sure. I, I couldn't answer your question about relative opportunities and vulnerabilities for uh, for the U.S. I think that that would be a good question if you uh, the next time we have a lecture with a true energy expert as opposed to uh, a national security person like me who has learned something about the energy field but uh, but really does not come from the field. But uh, refineries are very much a, a part of the calculation. Like many um, government officials, uh, the Chinese government, Wen Jiabao, Wu Yi, have begun to talk about some problems with, of course, China's energy dependency on imported oil. And I know that they've been experimenting with ways to, with other sort of energy sources. I remember several years ago reading about a project to liquefy coal, I mean, that's the only way I can describe mm -hmm. it, I'm not an energy expert, but to sort of to liquefy coal um, into oil. And since China has, I think, the third largest coal reserves, that seemed to be a promising lead. Do you know what's happened to those kinds of efforts to diversify um, so that it doesn't have to depend completely on imported oil yep. in the way it does now? Um, China's right now gets about close to 70% of its energy uh, from coal. Um, I, I, I think that China has the largest reserves in the world. Uh, I think they've got about a couple hundred years worth of reserves. Uh, the 70 percent number is an extraordinary number. If you look at the, kind of the global average, I think you'd see it'd be closer to 28, 30 percent for other countries. Uh, that presents numerous complex challenges. Uh, the first is that most of the coal is in North China, and most of China's water is in South China. Um, you need water to scrub coal and make it you know, bearably clean. Uh, 
So most, chi most Chinese coal leaves the northern uh, mines unscrubbed, hops on a train. 40% of Chinese train capacity is used for coal, transport of coal around the country. And it arrives at, you know, somewhere down south um, and is thrown into a power plant, uh, unscrubbed. So a lot of these power plants are basically burning dirt, mm -hmm. um, which we all know if we visit Chinese cities. Uh, Chinese cities are uh, characterized by this thick cloud of coal dust particulate. 16 out of 20 dirtiest cities in the world in terms of air pollution are Chinese. Uh, the level of solid particulate in the air, that the World Health Standard, the World Health Organization Standard is 60 to 90 micrograms per cubic meter. The average in China cities is 400. Um, that's all coal dust. Okay? And the Chinese people are increasingly um, intolerant of that. If you look at Chinese polling data, the environment has crept up near the top. It's the fourth most important issue in, in recent polls in China after having not been on the agenda at all. Um, the second issue that's raised by coal is global warming. And coal is uh, a much more a powerful contributor to global warming than petroleum or other sources of, uh, of, oil, of uh, energy. Uh, the Chinese position on global warming has evolved a little bit. Uh, if you look at the latest study that the National Development Reform Commission released on global warming, it accepts the reality of global warming. It talks about the severe consequences for China from global warming. But when it gets to the prescription recommendation section, it basically says we're going to keep doing what we're doing and this is the responsibility of the U.S. and the West and they've got to act. But I suspect that the next president of the United States, uh, whoever that may be, whichever party, is going to take the global warming issue uh, considerably more seriously than the current administration. And since China is now either the number one or number two emitter of greenhouse gases in the world and soon to be number one, for sure, um, that raises a potential uh, conflict between our two sides. Now, as for China's options, I mean, when China looks at energy options, it doesn't it face very happy choices. You know, it's 70 percent coal, and you know, right now the 3 percent dependent on natural gas. Uh, nuclear is, I don't know, about two or three percent, I forget, about two percent. Um, they're looking to build up to 40 nuclear power plants by 2020, and even that would raise nuclear power to only about four percent as a share of national energy. They have a fair amount of hydropower, and of course the petroleum piece is growing. But I think that most Chinese experts can't see a way to get away from coal. Uh, when you're looking at 10 percent annual growth with the accompanying energy needs and most of your coal, and you've got most of the coal in your ground. Uh, coal liquefaction, that's not a new technology. The Nazis did it. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's doable. It's feasible. Um, it is one of the options that uh, Chinese are looking at on a large scale. From the point of view of greenhouse gases and uh, global warming, it is not a very attractive option. Uh, it is an, it's an attractive option if you want to decrease dependence on foreign oil, but not in terms of greenhouse gases. Uh, the other technology that, that uh, people are looking at and Chinese will probably be looking at is uh, carbon uh, capture and sequestration. And that basically is a power plant. It's basically tubing from a power plant to take its emissions uh, down into the ground uh, into gigantic uh, uh, tubing systems uh, to be stored. And this is the direction in which a lot of European countries are thinking of going. I think every new power plant that's built in Germany now has to have a carbon capture and sequestration capability. 
there are pilot studies in the